Okay, it's the time to start. Uh, today I'm going to talk about interfaces, which means the boundaries between crystals. So let me begin by a question. Supposing you looked at a boundary in a transmission electron microscope, what would you see? What would you expect to see if you looked at a boundary in a transmission electron microscope? Any ideas? Sorry? Uh, you, it's not really a crystal, but it's between crystals. There are circumstances, okay, in which you can get extra spots from boundaries. For example, if the boundary is inclined and you have a beam going through the first crystal, then for the second crystal, both the transmitted and diffracted beams will form diffraction patterns. So that's called double diffraction. Okay. But what features would you expect to see inside a thin foil in a transmission electron microscope if you looked at a boundary? Yeah. Any ideas? Okay. Let me show you a picture. So focus on this region, okay? This is one crystal, this is another crystal. What are these, these things? Yeah. Any ideas what those lines are? These <coughs> dislocations, okay? Now, I'm going to prove to you that a boundary is nothing but a set of dislocations, okay? Um, everything I'm going to say today is described in much more detail, so you might not want to read detail, but in much more detail in this book, which you can download freely from my website, okay? Right, so we need to think about a boundary as a set of dislocations, and in order to demonstrate that, I'm going to start with a single crystal and create a boundary, okay? So on top, we have a single crystal, and to create a boundary, I cut the crystal in half, okay? I cut it along here, and then I tilt the two halves with respect to each other. So I get a bicrystal because this part will be in a different orientation from this part. But by tilting the crystal, there is a gap, okay? There's an empty space. So we've got to fill that empty space in some way. And that empty space has the shape of a, a, what we call a wedge, a thin slice, you know, like when you cut a cake, right? So it's bigger at the top and smaller at the bottom. And the perfect defect which would fill that space is an edge dislocation, okay? Because look, an edge dislocation has an extra half plane there. And what that means is that you are tilting the two halves of the crystal with respect to each other. So if I have a big gap, I put in lots of dislocations. If I have a very narrow gap, in other words, I've tilted the crystals only a little bit, then I put a few dislocations. So the of the boundary can be described in terms of a set of dislocations, in this case, edge dislocations, and the purpose of the dislocation here is to fill that space that we've created by tilting the two halves of the crystal with respect to each other, okay? So this is an imaginary operation uh, in the previous slide where we cut the crystal in half and we found that there is space which we don't see in real life and that's because that space is filled by dislocations. So everyone happy with that description? Because we are now going to develop that in order to work out the structure of the boundary in more detail and also um, the energy of the boundary per unit area because, you know, a dislocation has a certain energy per unit length, right? So if we just count the number of dislocations in a unit area of the boundary, then we've got the boundary energy per unit area. So it's not just a model, but when you look in the transmission electron microscope, you will see dislocations if you look at a sufficiently high resolution. And you can work out the Burgers vectors of those dislocations by doing electron diffraction experiments where you image using different diffracted beams. And when 
the dislocations become extinct, you know that your diffracted beam is 90 degrees to the Burgess vector, and you, then you'd find another extinction position. Taking a cross product, you get the Burgess vector, the orientation of the Burgess vector, right? So it's possible to not only determine the line vector, but also the Burgess vector by doing experiments in the electron microscope. So here is our boundary now, and the wedge that we had, the thin slice that we cut out to tilt the two crystals, is now filled with a set of dislocations. And the dislocations have a spacing, which is small d. And let's imagine always that we have a unit length, the plane of the board, right? So each one of these um, dislocation lines is one meter long into the board. And this is the angle, the tilt angle between the two crystals, which defines the orientation relationship because that's a right-handed angle about an axis out of the plane of the board. So you can define the orientation relationship between two like crystals by an angle of rotation and an axis of rotation. And the axis in this case is out of the plane of the board. So this is the spacing of the dislocations. And simple geometry tells you that the relationship between the spacing and the Burgers vector of the dislocation is given by this triangle. Uh, when theta is small, okay? So I can work out the misorientation between these two halves in terms of the Burgers vector of the interface dislocations and the spacing between the dislocations and tangent of theta equals B upon D, that's obvious, yeah? Tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent and if theta is small, then tangent of theta is approximately theta, okay? So we have a dislocation model of the grain boundary, which is beautiful because we can see the dislocations inside the transmission electron microscope. We know they have Burgers vectors, and the spacing of the dislocations and the Burgers vector will be precisely related to the tilt angle between the two crystals. Okay, so very simple model, beautiful model. So we now go on from this model to work out the energy per unit area of the boundary. So, uh, we've seen this relationship that tangent of theta is equal to uh, the Burgers vector, magnitude of the Burgers vector divided by the spacing between those lines because uh, it's a very simple relationship. And the number of total length of dislocations per unit area is simply 1 upon d because we've taken uh, the dislocations to be a unit length into the plane of the board. And this 1 upon d tells you the number of dislocations per unit length in the vertical direction. Yeah? If I divide a distance 1 by the spacing, then I get the number of dislocations. Right? Everyone happy with that? Okay. So the total length of dislocation per unit area, because we've taken one unit length into the plane of the board, is simply 1 upon the spacing of the dislocation lines. And therefore, the energy per unit area, which we will call sigma, is simply the energy per unit length of a dislocation multiplied by the dislocation length per unit area. Okay? Very, very simple equation. If you know the energy per unit length of the dislocation, then uh, the interfacial energy per unit area is given simply by the energy per unit length multiplied by the total length. Okay? Everyone happy with that? Now, can you remember from your courses how the energy per unit length of a dislocation varies with the Burgers vector? Any ideas? How does E scale with B? Yeah, very good. So the energy is proportional to the square of the Burgers vector. Okay? Uh, and that is why, you know, if you put two dislocations together, uh, they will repel each other. Okay? Because B squared plus B squared gives you 2B squared. Okay? And having two individual dislocations with a Burgers vector B is better than having one dislocation with. Burgers vector 2b because that will be 4b squared, right? 
So that's why they repel each other. They want to stay apart. So the interfacial energy is simply given by that multiplied by that and we know that 1 upon d is the same as 10 theta over b. Okay, so just take uh, b over here and we've got an equation telling us how the energy varies as a function of theta and we know that this here is proportional to b squared and therefore the interfacial energy varies directly with the Burgers vector and the tangent of theta. Okay? So if I increase the misorientation between the two halves then the interfacial energy increases and if the Burgers vectors of the dislocations are larger then obviously the interfacial energy must also be larger. Okay? So that's a very simple equation and let's see if that is obeyed in real life. Now a tangent function looks like this okay? uh, and uh, we are operating at small values of theta and I'll tell you why we are operating at small values of theta, small misorientations uh, and in that region you know it's more or less uh, a linear function. Okay? So tangent of theta increases almost linearly with theta. So we expect the interfacial energy to vary approximately linearly with misorientation between the two halves. What we find in reality is, forget about this part at the moment, but what we find in reality is that initially that's correct, okay? But as the misorientation continues to increase, the energy doesn't increase very much, okay? The interfacial energy per unit area doesn't increase very much. So the relationship breaks down roughly at an angle of about 15 degrees between the two halves of the crystals. So why is that? Now remember that we've got dislocations sitting on top of each other. Okay? Now if I look at an isolated dislocation in a crystal then its elastic strain field extends to infinity. Yeah? But if I put a dislocation on top of another dislocation then the extra half plane is under the empty space. Right? So they compensate for each other and the strain field is localized. So this is an isolated dislocation where you can see the strain field extends to large distances. So the energy per unit length is high. When I put dislocations on top of each other, the region which is in compression along here, uh, compression along here is cancelled by the tension region under the extra half plane of the top dislocation. And that means that the strain field roughly extends to the spacing between the dislocations which is D. So if you have an array of dislocations then the energy per unit length of the dislocation line is smaller than if you have an isolated dislocation. And this of course is exactly the reason why when you heat treat a material containing dislocations they will try to arrange themselves into walls, yeah? into, into effectively into sub-boundaries with small misorientations. So when you anneal a material the dislocations will try to arrange themselves in such a way that the regions of compression and tension are compensating. So our equation for the energy per unit length is not correct when we get to large theta because uh, the energy per unit length is not constant. If, if you are closer to another dislocation then the energy is reduced. Now just to remind you from your undergraduate lectures, the energy per unit length, yes it scales with b squared but we have a term over here which is R is the size of your crystal effectively, the distance to which the field extends and R naught is the size of the core of the dislocation. So if I go back to the um, slide showing the dislocation structure, here we have a lot of space. So elastic theory doesn't apply. So we cannot calculate the energy in the core region so we have to exclude the elastic energy calculation from the core region and we add an extra term to the dislocation energy per unit length which is the core energy. So you can imagine that the core is like a region of liquid metal because there's a lot of space for atoms to wobble about. So very thin region of liquid metal. Okay, so let's see how we can develop that equation to better represent the interfacial energy per unit area. Uh, 
Okay, so here is the standard equation from the books. This will be the core energy per unit length, which, you know, you could represent that as a liquid and get an estimate for that core energy. Uh, this is the extent to which the elastic strain field ext uh, extends, in other words, the size of your crystal. And this is the core radius. So now I make the approximation that the core radius is approximately the size of a Burgers vector. So I substitute the core radius by the Burgers vector. And I make a second approximation that the size, uh, the distance over which the strain field extends is simply the spacing between the dislocations in the interface. Okay? So I replace capital R by small d. And of course, small d is given by, um, um, yeah, here it is. Small d is given by b over theta, Burgers vector over theta. And therefore, I replace R by Burgers vector over theta and end up with this equation, which says, you know, per unit length will vary with the logarithm of theta, right? And therefore, my interfacial energy becomes a function like this, where I have um, the uh, logarithmic term here, and this is the core energy. And if I just simplify that, that's theta times a constant A times B, uh, minus B times log theta. So this function behaves like the curve that I showed you. It starts off more or less linearly and then flattens out because the energy per unit length of the dislocation is decreasing when you put the dislocations on top of each other. Okay, everyone happy with that? So we obtain a function which looks like this. Now, I've drawn additional information on that graph which is this, these dots over here. We still have something wrong with the theory because at particular values of theta, the energy of the boundary suddenly collapses, okay? So it's much lower than we expect. And you find that at special values of theta that our model fails and if you measure the physical properties of the boundary, for example, the diffusion coefficient along the boundary, it will also dramatically decrease at that value of theta, uh, indicating that at those special values of theta, the structure of the boundary becomes more coherent, coherent means very good fit with very little space, than at other values of theta. So we find these deep cusps in energy at particular values of theta. And why, why do we get that. So let me just uh, say that we now need to explain what happens at special values of theta where suddenly the boundary gains uh, coherency or a higher level of coherency than our dislocation model would imply. Okay, so I'm just going to switch to a movie and I want you to watch uh, carefully. Right, so wh what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a crystal, and in this case, it's a hexagonal crystal. You can see a hexagonal pattern, right? And I'm passing light through the crystal, so you can see it in three dimensions, okay? It's extending this way. I'm going to cut it in half in the plane of the board and rotate one half to with respect to the other, okay? So we are taking a hexagonal crystal, a uh, hexagonal lattice, cut the crystal in the plane of the board in half and rotate one half with respect to the other. In other words, I'm creating a bicrystal. And you'll see that at certain values of the rotation angle, something strange happens. That's my finger. Okay. So this is just one particular value of theta, and you can see that at certain points, the lattice points of the two crystals are exactly in the same place, right? So there's perfect matching between the two crystals at certain points here. And not only that, but those coincidence points, we call them coincidence points because they coincide exactly, yeah? They form a pattern, 
which is called a coincidence site lattice. So at particular values of theta, you get a certain fraction of the lattice points which are exactly matching between the two crystals. When I put the two crystals on the same origin and let them penetrate space as done here, you find patterns where you get a high density of coincidence points. And those patterns are called coincidence site lattices. Okay? So you can see, for example, here, there's an even higher density of coincidence points. Yeah? So when we get to those special orientations of theta, the boundary gains a lot of coherency. And let's assume that we have one third of the lattice points in exact coincidence. Then we say that that boundary is a sigma 3 coincidence site lattice boundary. Okay? If one fifth of the lattice points are exactly coincident between the two, then we say that it's a sigma 5 boundary. So a sigma 5 boundary will have a somewhat higher energy than a sigma 3 boundary because only one in five of the lattice points are coincident. Okay? So everyone happy with that concept? Okay, so here, for example, we are plotting real values of the interfacial energy in, in I think this is aluminum, yes, uh, it's an aluminum tilt boundary about the 1, 1, 0 axis, and we are measuring the interfacial energy, and at sigma 3, where 1 in 3 of the lattice points are coincident, you get a dramatic decrease in interfacial energy. And this is now a sigma 11 boundary, so 1 in 11 of the lattice points between the two crystals are coincident. And we get another cusp in the boundary. And of course, you can find these at many different values of theta. Okay, so in, in the book that I uh, put up in the second slide, you can find uh, how to calculate the sigma value and also tables of what axes and angles will produce various values of sigma. And when you're doing EBSD, the software allows you to identify high coincidence lattice boundaries. Yeah? So it'll give you sigma values and so forth if you ask the system to do so. So a sigma value is not associated with a particular boundary plane. It's an orientation relationship which gives you the coincidence. The boundary plane can be put anywhere inside the bicrystal. Okay? And that boundary will always have one third of the lattice points coincident if sigma is three. So sigma defines effectively a special orientation relationship and the boundary planes that you put, whatever they are, will have one third of the lattice points exactly coincident. Okay? So when we say a sigma three boundary, we're not referring to a particular plane but it's effectively defining an orientation relationship which gives you good fit between the two crystals. What's sigma 1? Yeah, there's no boundary, yeah, because everything is coincident, okay? Right, uh, I'll illustrate um, the coincidence site lattice in a slightly different way, okay? Um, now, we often talk about the stacking sequence of planes, right? Like the 111 plane in austenite. What is the stacking sequence? ABC, 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 right? Uh, if I asked you what's the stacking sequence of the 112 plane, you probably don't know. Yeah? So, how do I work out the stacking sequence? Well, let's imagine the 111 plane, all right? Then, if we take the 111 vector, then its magnitude is root 3a, yeah, because it's 111, so the magnitude of that vector is root 3a. And then I want to find out how many planes between the two lattice points separated by 111. So I divide the magnitude of the 111 vector by the spacing of the 111 planes, and the spacing of the 111 planes is a over root 3. So root 3a divided by a over root 3 gives me 3. So that's the repeat sequence. So if it's 112, then the magnitude of the shortest 112 vector is root 6a. Uh, 
divide by the spacing, which is A over root 6. So the repeat is A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, E, F. So I'm going to um, create a bicrystal by rotating 180 degrees about 112 axis. Uh, so imagine that we have a, a crystal here with the stacking of 112 planes, so A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, E, F. And I then cut the crystal over here precisely and I create the other half by rotating 180 degrees about 112. Now, 180 degrees about 112 is actually a twinning operation. Yeah? One lattice will be reflected from the other. So if I have one lattice there, I can generate the other one by reflection across the twin plane. Okay? So that's a, the, one of the definitions of a twin. So to generate this sequence here, I take my boundary, which is located at D, and I just reflect. So C here is a reflection of this, B is a reflection of this, A is a reflection of A, and so on. Okay? So 180 degrees rotation about 112 is exactly the same as a mirror plane at that location. Okay? Now, I have the grain B and grain A starting from the same origin, okay? just like I did in that movie. And now I need to identify where the coincidences are. So look, this is exactly the same position as that. This one is this, and so on. So what is the sigma value here? Yeah, somebody said it? Three, right? You said three? Yeah. Because one third of them are in exactly the same point in space. Okay. It's just another way of doing the same thing. I'll show you a mathematical way uh, towards the end of the lecture. So these are very important concepts because the properties of the boundary determine the properties of polycrystalline materials in many, many contexts. Okay. So if you are thinking about impurity segregation to a boundary, then less impurity will segregate to a low sigma boundary because there isn't enough space there. Yeah? Okay, let's uh, do a little bit of matrix algebra. Okay? Just very, very simple stuff. Uh, again, this is familiar to you that if I want to specify a direction here with respect to the basis vectors A1, A2, A3, then I can write the vector in terms of the basis vectors where u1, u2, and u3 are the components of u with respect to a1, a2, a3. And I really want to, you know, if, I, if I'm going to refer the vector u to different frames of reference, then I need some way of defining the frame of reference with just one letter. So I use capital A to say, I'm referring to A1, A2, A3. The components U1, U2, U3 are referred to these particular axes. If I refer them to another axis, they will be different. So that's our vector, and U1, U2, U3. And the same vector in a different basis will have different components, right? So I need to identify when I write u1, u2, u3, which frame of reference I'm referring to. Okay, Okay. so this is 1, 1 in this basis, and it's 2, 0 in this oblique basis. Okay, So it's exactly the same vector, but I'm referring it to different frames of reference. So if you just told somebody that this is a vector 1, 1, and they were interested in looking at different frames of reference, that would be confusing. So to avoid that problem, we use a basis symbol A, followed by the vector U. In the basis A, the components of the vector U are 1, 1. Okay. And similarly, in the basis B, its components are different, 2, 0. Okay. So we use notation like this, which is due to Bold and McKenzie, 
do absolutely make clear that we are referring to a particular frame of reference when we specify the components of a vector. Okay. Everyone happy with that? So this is just a conventional notation. Right. Same applies to planes, okay? That with planes we use round brackets and the convention is that the basis symbol will be on the right because it's a row vector whereas here, sorry, is that the right? From your point of view, yeah, that's, that's the right. Whereas here it's on the left when we write directions which are as column vectors, okay? So directions represented as column vectors, the square bracket. Uh, the basis symbol is on this side and row vectors, the basis symbol is on the other side, okay? So this is notation which you simply have to learn here. Yeah. Okay, now let's, uh, let's see how we can transform the components of a vector from one basis to another. So here we have the vector u and we have two bases. We have a1, a2, a3 and then we have b1, b2, b3. And just by looking at this diagram you can see that the vector u has the components 1, 1, 1 in a and its components in the basis B, it goes 0 along B1, okay? It goes 2 along B2 and 1 along B3, okay? So we have BU and AU. Just like we did it for the two-dimensional graph that I had earlier. Right, so, I want to now specify the basis vectors of A in terms of the basis vectors of B. So A1 here is equal to B1 plus B2, right? Yeah, can you see that? A1 is equal to B1 plus B2. So A1 equals 1B1 plus 1B2 plus 0B3. A2, which is over here, is minus B1 plus B2 and 0 along B3. So I have bar 1, 1, 0. And A3, of course, is equal to B3, and therefore we have A3 is equal to 1, B3. So you've got these three vector equations. And it's very easy to represent them in terms of a matrix. So the same equations here are exactly the same equations are given by A1, A2, A3 as a row matrix, B1, B2, A3 as a row matrix, and this comes from 1 bar 1 0, 1 bar 1 0, 1 1 0, and 0 0 1. So if I take this row and I multiply it by this first column, that means B1 times 1 plus B2 times 1 plus B3 times 0, then I get A1, which is this equation. Similarly, if I take A2 here, then B1 times minus 1 plus B2 times 1 plus B3 times 0 gives me this equation. So done nothing, nothing special here, simply represented those three equations in terms of a matrix. And this matrix here is our coordinate transformation matrix. Okay. So each column of this matrix, which we'll call JA, yeah, so it transforms the coordinates of a vector from the basis A to the basis B. It represents the components of a basis vector of A with respect to B. So if you, can, if you can draw a diagram like this, it's very easy to derive a coordinate transformation matrix. And then, supposing I say to you that I need to know what the vector 1, 2, 5 in A is in the basis B, it's very, very easy to do that. Okay? You just use this matrix to find that. Right, so this is any arbitrary vector u and you can convert it into any arbitrary vector uh, any sorry uh, uh, into you can find its uh, components in another basis system if you know the coordinate transformation matrix now note one thing very carefully like basis symbols must always be next to each other okay so a and a must be next to each other if you've got a b over here you've done something wrong Okay. So when, 
later on in the course, we write a long equation with several of these matrices, you'll know that you've got something wrong if like basis symbols are not next to each other. Okay? So effectively, this defines the orientation relationship between that tetragonal cell and the cubic cell that we had. Okay? Because you can find out which vector is parallel to which vector in the other crystal. So I if I go back, the 1, 1, 1 vector of A is exactly parallel to 0, 2, 1 of the tetragonal cell. Yeah? So that's exactly what you do when you are talking about orientation relationships. Okay, here's another example. Um, if I want to find the coordinate transformation matrix in the same way, then I need to find the components of 1, 0, 0 in the basis B. Okay, so the components of 1, 0, 0, A in the basis B, assuming this is a unit vector, is simply cos 45, okay? Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, 1, 0, 0, B. So the component of A on B is simply cos 45, is the projection onto 1, 0, 0, B. For A2, it'll be sine 45, cos 45 naught, and so on. And therefore, this will form the first uh, row of our coordinate transformation matrix and so on. Okay? Uh, then I can use that in order to do a transformation of the components of this particular vector in basis E. If I go through this process of multiplication, it comes out as a 3, 1, 0 in the crystal B. Okay? Now in this example, the two lattices were exactly identical. They were just rotated with respect to each other. Okay, so they both had, uh, both were cubic. But in the previous example, uh, we had uh, tetragonal and cubic. So the volumes of the cells were different in the previous example. Here the volumes are identical. So if you take a determinant of this matrix, it'll just come out as one because the volumes are identical. With the previous one, because it's a tetragonal cell and a cubic cell, they have different volumes. So the determinant will be the ratio of the volumes of those cells. Okay? Okay. I, I, obviously, you know, we are in this, uh, these two vectors are exactly identical. So their magnitudes must be exactly identical. We are, they have different components, but their magnitudes must be identical. This is just to prove that. If you work out the magnitudes of these two vectors in the basis A, it must be exactly identical to that in basis B, because a vector is a vector. It doesn't matter which coordinate system you use. Uh, okay. This example that I showed you is basically a rotation of the crystal about 0, 0, 1. Okay. And the fact that this has a determinant of 1 means that it is a rotation matrix, a simple rotation matrix, okay? Right, uh, I, I won't go into a yet another example, okay? <laughs> but in that book that I mentioned to you, you can find many worked examples. That means examples that have gone through for all kinds of things like cementite and ferrite and austenite and ferrite and so forth. Now, it's relatively easy to prove that the rotation matrix, uh, which has a determinant of 1, the elements of the matrix are given by the angle of rotation theta and the components of a unit vector around which you do the rotation. So u1, u2, u3 is our axis of rotation. Okay? So the derivation of this is given in that book. It's a little bit lengthy. But this is extremely useful, you know, because if you want to find a rotation matrix for a 25.2 degree rotation about 1, 2, 3, yeah, then you express 1, 2, 3 as a unit vector. That will give you u1, u2, u3. And the angle of rotation is, uh, gives you the terms n and m. Okay? Now, what happens if the determinant is minus 1? 
So that's strange, isn't it, if you get a determinant of minus 1 in this context. It means that you are not doing a right-handed rotation, okay? So a right-handed rotation, if this is the axis of rotation, it's that way. If you do a left-handed rotation, then the determinant will be minus 1, okay? So stick to right-handed rotations. I think, you know, when doing this, you need to be careful that the axes you have chosen for your cell are right-handed, okay? Now, similarly, if I gave you a rotation matrix, you would be able to work out the axis and angle because, look, if I add up these terms here, then that is simply 1 plus 2 cos theta, okay? Given that u1 squared plus u2 squared plus u3 squared is just 1. It's a unit vector, okay? And similarly, uh, you can derive the angles because con component u1 here is... 2, 3, which is 2, 3, that one, okay, minus 3, 2, divided by 2 sine theta. So you can work out the components of the vector, you can work out the angle of rotation given a rotation matrix, okay. So again, this is, uh, this is in, in my book on how to, well, this is pretty easy. Just look at these elements and you'll be able to derive these equations very, very simply. Uh, but the derivation of the top part is a little bit more complicated, but you'll find it in the book. So an X single pair is exactly equivalent to a rotation matrix. There's no difference, it's just a different way of defining orientation relationships. Right, now, I need to go to the movie again. Okay, now these are the lattice points from the two crystals, and these points are exactly coincident between the two crystals, right? So if I have a lattice vector going that way from crystal A, that necessarily is also a lattice vector of crystal B, yeah? Because those are lattice points from the two crystals, right? So uh, lattice vectors, will have integral indices. Okay, uh, sorry. So I'm going to show you a very easy way of deriving a sigma value. Is that supposing I have a rotation matrix here, which is two thirds, two thirds, minus one third, minus one third, two thirds, two thirds and so on, okay? So the components are fractional components. If I take the fraction out here so that everything in there turns into the smallest integers, then one divided by that gives you the sigma value because that means that, you know, the lattice vector in one crystal at a coincidence point will also be a lattice vector in the other crystal. So it's very simple to derive the sigma value if you can find a fraction which will convert all the elements of the matrix into integers, okay? Now the sigma value concept is very important because now you have very easy tools to work out sigma values, you know, your computer programs will give you those values and you know that when you have uh, small sigma values, in other words a large fraction of the lattice points are coincident, it will be a low energy boundary and its properties will be totally different from a high sigma value boundary because diffusion coefficients, interfacial energy, the strength of the boundary, everything will depend on the structure of the boundary. So now that you understand this, you should be able to use the information from EBSD experiments or other experiments much more uh, clearly to define structure property relationships. Okay? So the purpose of this course is not just to show you the different concepts, but I hope that you go on to apply them in interpreting your experimental evidence, okay? Okay, that's all for today. Thank you.